in this hour, and we have Professor Aisling Kelly here from Computer Science. So take it away. Okay, sorry, we had some sound problems. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today, just generally, about a very quotidian everyday experience um, that gives a general perception about public perceptions about AI, and then talk about two contexts that I worked in uh, last year and this year, one being hosting a designer-led conversation about AI with a group of folks, uh, and then work I do involving machine learning and healthcare. So this is just to kind of set up the talk. Last September, I was trying to go from here to Poznan port in, in Poland, but uh, Hurricane Florence really screwed up how I was trying to get there. Um, so I couldn't, airports were closed, and I kind of entered into this Sisyphean circle of hell. And unfortunately, the audio isn't working on this, but I recorded myself uh, on the phone trying to change my flight. And what they're actually saying here is explaining to me that stay on the line and that I was 28th in line. And this, when you're trying to get out of the country in four hours, that was a little bit frightening. So I began to think, well, that's crazy. How can I be 28th in line? Um, maybe it's because I've never flown with this Polish airline before. Maybe it's because I was kind of pissing one of the messages I left earlier. I was just trying to work out, there's no way I can, there can be this many people in front of me. Um, but then I started thinking about this, and this is a case where you can't also hear the audio here, but I think folks are familiar with Dr. Dow, who was forcibly removed um, from a plane after he'd already checked in on United. And this is quite a, um, the audio in this is quite disturbing, because people in the, on the plane are completely kind of flummoxed as somebody who has checked in sitting in their seat is being forcibly removed from the plane. So straight away, I guess going with some of the folk theories, people started having some perception, like why was this gentleman selected and so you know, treated so harshly? And in this case, people kind of assumed a, a racist motivation on behalf of either the airlines or the people who were the security staff or others. But instead, the, there was a whole bunch of um, ideas that were coming out here. So in this case, this was looking at the Washington Post and they were like, okay, there's an issue here that there's no real proper regulation for the airlines about who to kick off a flight. And in this case, they also looked at this and they found no evidence of race or nationality-based discrimination. But I'm like, so why was he selected and asked to get off the plane? So they were talking about that there was no pattern here of rule breaking. So the idea is like, well, okay, if there's no pattern, then is there a policy? And how do people get selected? And who is doing the selection? So in this case, there's a slightly different one. So this happened to me two days later. Um, and in this case, a passenger who had paid a full fare, $1,000, to fly first class from Hawaii back to Los Angeles um, was threatened with handcuffs. He was sitting in first class, and they came along like, you have to give up your seat. And he was like, I'm not giving up my seat. I paid for this seat. And so things got kind of testy, and security guards were called. And eventually, this is what happened, saying, OK, fine. We're just going to downgrade you to economy class as the solution. And then, the, uh, kind of to add insult to injury, they placed him in the middle seat between a married couple who were in the midst of a nasty fight and refused to be seated next to each other. And he states, they argued the whole way back nearly six hours. It was a lot of fun. Right? So again, here we have a somebody who's able to afford their full class ticket. And like, why were they selected? So this is, a, again, looking at kind of public discussion about this. And this is from Professor Julia Underwood. And she was talking about how these airlines are so locked into their policies. So she's not talking about patterns now. She's saying that there's these policies that there's no room for empathy. And what I was interested in here was talking about that there was members of the crew there, they were apologizing, but they said they weren't able to do anything. Like they weren't able to use common sense to try and work out how to solve this problem, which they typically should have been trained in. But this idea that, that we are at the mercy of this policy that we don't understand, and that we don't even know how it aggregates these ideas. And so somebody like Cathy O'Neill, who I know is controversial in the CHI HCI community um, for recent comments she made about how HCI is, or nobody is looking at algorithmic fairness or unfairness. So I put it in here saying it's a, this is a, like an airport read that a lot of people have looked at to get a sense of what is going on with these algorithms. And she talks specifically and wrote after this idea that it's really, and this kind of echoes Jenna's earlier talk about the nature of dignity itself, and like this idea of like who is the lowest value customer. And I was very heartened when I started looking into this because I travel a lot with two small children that I'm least likely to be bumped because mothers with kids are real pain in the asses, <laughs> and kick up fuss, and just you just don't want that video, right, of the mom with the crying children, and then it also costs more. So, good for me. But this idea of how they're selecting uh, this lowest value customer, again, it's incredibly opaque, 
All right, so she's talking about, how, again, that the, she was on the 99% Invisible uh, podcast, and she's saying that they're not evil, they're just really problematic because they're mysterious, they're destructive, and they're all over the place. So it's everything from my fairly minor inconvenience trying to get to Poland, which actually took me 36 hours, so maybe not so minor. But there are obviously these larger, serious social justice issues, again, that Jen was talking about earlier, that are really, really deeply problematic. And again, I also think about where algorithms are kind of forcing or influencing uh, public opinion. It's not just my little experience there, but also at the level of this guy, and more specifically for me as an Irish person, the level of this moron, and how they are using algorithms and all sorts of different ways to really um, uh, kind of change and temper debate and kind of civic discourse. So there are kind of two questions that I've been interested in exploring is this idea of, uh, as a designer, how is AI some, some form of a material? How can I work with it um, in a kind of in a sensible and purposeful and straightforward way? And also in these systems, again, thinking about not just these transactional systems where we do a lot of work to, and the algorithm gets smarter at giving us recommendations, but rather when, if I'm doing all that work, shouldn't I also get smarter? Um, shouldn't my experience also be enhanced? So this is some of the work I do in, in working in the design community and in healthcare. So last uh, summer, uh, together with some really wonderful colleagues who work on machine learning at Mayo Clinic, another colleague who uh, works in uh, kind of startups in, in engineering, Nora, who's actually a curator of uh, art technology, and Alan Smeaton, who's a distinguished AI and machine learning professor. And we convened a conversation at the Design Research Society conference, which had anthropologists and designers and a lot of artists to come together and try and think about how they might understand and conceptualize this design material. So again, coming up with this idea over a multiple day um, experience, how can we think about this idea of enhancing the experience of, of the human actors specifically? And so again, oh, I can't listen to this, uh, play this, but we started by looking at things like in the movie Her, there's, I'm now going to narrate this to you. There's a very evocative moment where he's talking to the AI agent that he's fallen in love with. And it kind of dawns on him all of a sudden that maybe his understanding of an operating system is quite different from what this kind of alien algorithm he's interacting with when he discovers that this entity that he's in love with is actually also involved in over 11,000 other relationships. <laughs> And then you begin to think about, wow, these algorithms, maybe they just move along and they conceptualize this human-machine relationship in such an alien and radically different way. And so this is a useful um, uh, quote from Maciej Keglowski, who is a really interesting thinker on this. And he talks about that there's no slot in the algorithm that says, insert your moral compass here. So he's saying, in applying them to human beings, we, we open ourselves, you know, we leave ourselves open to unpleasant surprises, like if we are under the mistaken belief that there should be a moral compass in there. Um, so maybe we, he talks, uh, has a wonderful talk that I encourage you to listen to called Build a Better Monster. And you see, these are some of the outcomes which are kind of probably very obvious and typical that came out of our discussion with these very diverse folks who are very interested in like, is it going to be transparent? Am I able to read the data in accessible forms? How do I know if the data is reliable? What happens when something goes wrong? <clears throat> Again, mimicking a lot of some of the conversations from earlier today, that can we have options to participate in this? Some of the other things that came up that were a little bit more surprising were a really detailed conversation about nobody could agree, or maybe we said we agreed to agree that AI can be all of these things, subject, artifact, material, method, tool, and system. And some of the anthropologists there were very interested in this idea, like, well, maybe it's not negative. It would be wonderful for me as an anthropologist to create a bot that could do 20,000 interviews in a day. Wouldn't that be really useful for me? Or others coming at this idea that, oh, we are setting up a false dichotomy, a too much a binary, like this is a human and this is a machine. Can we use the uh, critical and theoretical and philosophical lenses of intersectionality or relationality or communality to think about AI in this, in, in, in this kind of a shifted lens? And finally, there was some work about what would speculative and critical AI be within the lenses of critical design. So these are some ways that we go from public perception of these folk uh, theories, I guess, about how these algorithms work to ideas coming more from art and social science about some ways that we can begin to interrogate uh, AI. So that's kind of one element of my work. The other is through healthcare. 
And so this is a group that I co-lead here at, at Virginia Tech on developing systems for interactive neurorehabilitation. And so quite, this is a subset of our group of about 40 people here in at Carnegie Mellon and at Emory University in Arizona State. And so we have folks obviously from really, really different backgrounds all coming together. And what I want to talk about today is we haven't yet developed the AI for our system. We're building semi-automated systems for the home because we have a whole slew of things to solve before that. Okay, so we, I work primarily in stroke, which is, as I said, the most common neurological disorder uh, worldwide. So after surgery and, and um, medical intervention, or chemical intervention, it, it's left to therapy, okay? But it's very expensive to go to therapy. Um, it's hard to get there. So home-based therapy is an idea. Can we have a system that can give you therapy at home? This is great, but this, uh, you know, I work with the engineers, and they're like, well, let's put cameras in every room. And I'm like, you put cameras in every room in your house and see how you feel about that. Also, it's expensive, but the hardest thing is reproducing the therapist's supervision, okay? So our goal is can we create fairly cheap ones for the home that will motivate therapy, capture the movement correctly, and evaluate it coherently. So movement quality is a tricky one, so you can't quite hear the um, sound here. Well, these are two children I know pretty well, and yeah. what's fun about this is we can look and say, yes, the smaller one is trying to mimic the movement of the older one, and she wants to, her dress to go out. And we recognize that as potentially dancing, right? For running open pose on this is just like, I'm not sure if they're humans, right? And the shapes. So we can look at this, and so we're like, assessing movement quality is really, really challenging. So one of the things that we work on, we started out with these huge systems, right, which are great. They're very, very accurate at understanding kinematic information, but they're not something that you can feasibly put in the home, particularly of a stroke survivor who's not able to put objects on their body either. So one of the things that we've been working on in trying to think of this aspirational idea is can we create these cyberhuman agents that help the patient get better, but also help the therapist in this case get better too, okay? So we have these ideas that the human-machine co-development must be meaningful. Um, in particular, we're looking at doing this in a very participatory, iterative way. So we'll skip to this. This is the type of system we have right now, which has custom-designed objects. And we use this as a very simple camera setup. And working with the therapists who've worked over a considerable period of time with us in developing uh, active protocols for manipulating these types of um, devices for upper extremity. So this, for example, is not in the, we don't do user tests right now. This is one of our ambassadors. So we have a variety, I work at Emory Hospital with about 15 patients there who are there to help us. This is a non-therapeutic intervention. Give us a lot of ideas and feedback about the systems and they are fairly brutal. But in this case, <laughs> the idea is that this is a system that would sit in your tabletop at home. The patient directs the whole interaction um, in terms of deciding when to turn on the camera to record what, uh, in this case, what he is doing. So in the interest of time, I'll move forward, but some of the things that are useful for us to think about are having meaningful conversations with the therapist about where would cameras go in the home, how they would like to control them, how they want the data to go back to the therapist, and what to do when the feedback is incorrect. So one of the challenges for us with this system is saying you're 80% confident that that was done correctly is not adequate for the doctors. And so they're like, unless you're very, very sure that that was either done correctly and why, you have to give a different form of feedback. So this patients, for example, are saying, if you don't know, show me a video of me doing it correctly. You should have that already in the system, and that's the most useful form of feedback. Um, so for this is the next problem that we have. So we've, I've gone down there to Emory many, many, many times. We've collected lots and lots of data. Our problem is, how do you label that data? Okay, we need to label the data. And so we have created these interfaces for physiotherapists to come in, and they've developed an ontology, and they're labeling the data for us. We start to see things like this. One of the biggest problems, we're trying to create an automated system. The therapists fundamentally don't agree with each other about what they're seeing. It depends on their training, for example. So we look at this and we have therapists who are much more inclined to go with the carrot and those who go with the stick. So we start out with four therapists and it's just not adequate for us to get an alpha level of correlation. It needs to be at least about 80%. And right now, we are at 80% for some of them, but at others. So in response to looking at this data, we went back to them with these surveys saying, you fundamentally disagree here. You're giving different rankings and scores. And they continue to fundamentally disagree. So this is a challenge for us. It's like, how can we get some sort of thing when the therapists themselves, their approaches are radically different? And how do we train maybe different types, different flavors of machine algorithms that fit the training profile and approach of a particular therapist? So this is where I was most recently. We're like, if we can't get four to agree, why don't we up the stakes and bring 12 in? 
And so this is what I did in, in spending it working in Carilion Hospital. In this case, we're expanding from stroke to those with knee replacement. Again, how can we get folks to come in, look, start looking at this data, labeling it, and finally getting people to come together with some form of agreement. So this, to finish up, is ultimately where we really want to go. We have these systems. There's all these loops in it that we hope are enhancing the human experience as well, including for us as the system designers. We have our patient who is using things with the system. We give them good feedback. We also send ideas about the system to the training therapists. And then we have these labeling therapists down here. So it's a whole ecosystem that we're trying to build. And the one bit that we, this idea of like refining the algorithm, like we haven't even design the algorithm yet, because we have all these other parts to do first. Um, but in this case, we're finding that therapists are getting really, really good at more precisely describing what it is that they're looking at and how to make that computable. And that's been kind of a real um, progress forward in just understanding what the, what the nature of the problem is. So that's a very different approach for us to, to AI in that context. So that's me. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Why don't we switch speakers and computers? We should take that off. Oh, hey. That was a great talk. Um, I wonder if you could talk more about sort of the, the virtue of the semi-automation, because it looks to me that this AI application that you were working on, there's multi-layer that spans over different places in the country and over time. To some degree, I would assume that, in, especially in the sense of healthcare, there's some sort of intermediate journey. It could be possibly a medical application. How do you plan on maybe sort of preserving that kind of feedback and uh, sort of dynamic space in like as you sort of sophisticate the? Uh, the yeah, that, that's a good point about disagreement. One thing is the the patients often disagree with the feedback as well. And it's quite funny when we run studies because it's my, I'm the person giving the instructions in the videos. So when I'm there, they're like, why did you give me that? I'm like, I didn't give it to you, the system gave it to you. But that's something we want to put into the system that at the end of a, a session at home, the patient also annotates and evaluates their own experience. The reason it's semi-automated is that the information has to go back to the therapist every evening. And then they look at a summary of that and they can change and adapt the protocol. So the idea of a fully unsupervised system is not necessarily, uh, the medical field is not uh, happy with that right now, that there needs to be kind of some form of check-in. Um, but we're very interested in the idea of the patient also being able to disagree with the system um, and help us train the attention model in a more appropriate way for their particular um, kind of disability. Yeah, I, I took the power of being the co-chair and assigned me a talk slot. So, all right, okay. So, um, right. So, um, so, the, so we talked about nudges yesterday a little bit, and then the way I have structured this talk is essentially in two parts: uh, nudges to think, and then audits to investigate. So, the first part of the talk is more about uh, what's what's the good part of uh, of algorithms, and then what new interactions could be designed to make uh, the human critically think while they are interacting with news and information, and the the second part, the audit part, is more about focusing on the not so good part. So uh, some of the things which Jenna was talking earlier, like how do we audit algorithmic systems to find what are the things that is wrong with them. And in this particular case, I'm going to talk about auditing search algorithms for, for misinformation. And, and when I was uh, creating this talk, and, and after I gave the title of the talk, and then I created it. So I was like, how do I tie both, this, both these things together? And, and I think David Laser's uh, science uh, article, op-ed article on the, this quote from that article really ties these two concepts together. So he says that we do need to create a new field around social algorithms. So all, all, all of these, all of these uh, talks, uh, all of these concepts are around that social algorithm and, and why that is slightly different from when we think about just algorithm in, in standalone way because these social algorithms interplace not just the computational go, uh, code but also the uh, social interactions of, of real human beings. All right, so. Uh, so we talked about nudges a lot, and so, so just to give a little bit of background, uh, so the concept of nudges, uh, when, when I read it, it comes from uh, Sunstance and Taylor's famous book, also goes by the same name. And in this book, they 
uh, basically focus on this on this cons on this idea that people do not really make rational choices and oftentimes their decisions are are influenced by their social interactions by their cognitive biases by certain heuristics and so on um, and they also mention this aspect of uh, two systems of thinking the uh, reflective system and the automatic system and 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 as the name suggests, so the automatic system is when people make these quick snap decisions uh, about reading news, about going to Twitter, tweeting, uh, retweeting. Uh, and then reflective uh, decision is uh, where people think and, and make some conscious decisions. So in real, in real world scenario, this could be when you are uh, you know, deciding whether you should take this job offer versus not. Right. So, and, and this also has parallels to uh, Dan Kahneman's uh, book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. So uh, Sunstein talks about this concept of nudges, and, and he uses this concept to uh, say that the nudges could be a way to steer uh, human behavior in, in, in pro-social manner, right? So to steer civic behavior. So a good way to think about it is, is an example where how a cafeteria, if, if they, des they design a nudge where uh, healthy food are placed at the eye level, and then the junk food items are present at the lower level. So the, now the user is nudged towards the healthy food item, but they also have a choice if they want to go for the, for the non-healthy food item. So essentially, nudges are these choice architectures where you're, you're free to ignore the, the, the nudge, but you are also able to take, make the choice to, to opt for the, uh, for the better stiff civic behavior. And, and he makes this argument that if we go for these uh, choice-based architecture, it's actually better rather than mandating uh, the, the people or, or the humans to do certain things versus not do certain things. So, and, and this sort of uh, nudge uh, uh, scenario has worked very well in, in promoting uh, healthy, uh, you know, pro-social activities, anti-obesity policies. I think he's also used in uh, financial regulation, uh, environmental policies, and like a bunch of different scenarios. Um, so we were thinking, how, what if we actually bring these concept of nudges back to the online social platforms and to kind of, is there a way to use this concept of nudges to make people critically think while they are accessing news and information? So, I mean, this is a, 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 a real study and much more, you know, smaller scale rather than the big Sunstein uh, study uh, across a huge population of people. Uh, so, the, in this study, we basically try to do like very two very simple nudges. First is called the emphasize, and the second one is called the de-emphasize nudge. <laughs> so, what the emphasize nudge does is, if if the news that you're reading on on Twitter, if it's coming from uh, mainstream uh, media, and many people have questioned that news, we sort of nudge the user uh, that. Uh, by show, emphasizing that aspect. So if the emphasis appears as a yellow background, and the de-emphasize is essentially if it's coming from an alternative uh, website, in this case, 100percentfedup.com, uh, it, it shows the user that uh, it kind of hides that news, not really hides, but blurs it, making it hard for the reader to read, and also shows this tooltip that the source might be not credible. And then we uh, poll the user uh, uh, for, you know, how, based on these nudges, how do you, how do you, uh, what's the credibility perception of, of this uh, news source? Uh, so this is a quick uh, demo in for, for how this tool works in practice. We call it feed reflex. Essentially, this is a way for people to reflect on their feed. Uh, so yeah, the user installs it on, on Twitter, and now he's, he or she is going through their feed. And uh, so yeah, so this is Fox News, and we consider this, this as mainstream, and so people might disagree with that, but that's a discussion for another time. But, but essentially, in the, this particular news article, people have a question through the replies in, in Twitter. So we, uh, the, the algorithm computes that, yes, this is a questionable uh, content also coming from mainstream. It highlights it. And then the user uh, uh, has a way to uh, sh uh, enter their uh, credibility perception for that news item. Um, the next item, which is blurred out, that's coming from Breadbart, uh, uh, and we had an in-house journalist who actually, uh, so that's Mike Harney, who, who made us uh, decide, okay, this is not mainstream, this could be non-mainstream, and uh, so it is blurred out, and then again, uh, the user enters the credibility perception for, for this uh, news article. So we are trying to see whether the, these sort of nudges has any effect if, if the user is exposed to this nudge versus not exposed to this nudge. How do they respond in, in terms of the credibility perception of, this, of, of news items on their Twitter feed? So uh, this is uh, the short version of the result. Uh, so we, of course, we ran into several difficulty in, in terms of recruiting people. But the short version of the result is 
uh, the nudges worked. Uh, so what you see here is, is that difference in the, uh, in the treatment and the control group. So the treatment group, the difference is ac actually statistically significantly different. So mainstream content was significant, uh, non-mainstream content uh, was rated significantly lower in credibility compared to mainstream content for treatment. But the, the same thing is, is not, uh, the same effect is not there for control group. group. So in terms of the, the quant results, we were excited, so, so that, that was good. And then we also talked to the users, and we saw that same aspect of reflective thinking that I was talking about earlier uh, it w was, was actually uh, shown in, in the way they were uh, interacting with these <coughs> nudges. So this is a user, and this is we, when we coded their interviews, we found uh, this, what we call the stop and think aspect, right? So this, this user says that normally, like sometimes you scroll past news, but this would be highlighted or faded out. It would catch your eye, uh, make you look a little more into it instead of just reading past the title, right? And then people also engaged a little bit more. They clicked and, and read the news uh, a bit more. We also found there was effect of questionnaire. So that because of the questionnaire itself, uh, people were actually trying to, uh, you know, the, this, this user says that uh, they are evaluating whether this news is coming from a biased perspective or, or not. So they are, it made them think, actively think while they were answering the question. So that was all good. So they, this gave, gave us some insight that the nudges which Sunston was, was making them work on offline uh, scenario, there is some potential of, of making them work in online scenarios for addressing pr probably these potential concerns with uh, misinformation and fake news and so on. But the story is not all that simple, right? Uh, so this is, these are the failures on the right side, the, ri the right side plot. So when we uh, try to uh, uh, analyze the same data considering the demographics of the user, so whether they are Democrat, Independent, or, or Republican, the effects were different. So for Democrats and indep Independent, of course, we do see the, the nudges did work, but it was, it was a, a failure when it came to the Republican user. And I don't have answers as to how to, how to address this problem, and our reviewers were, al were also not happy about this. Uh, however, uh, I mean, <laughs> there are some questions which came up. So maybe, maybe when we are thinking of these design technologies to, uh, to, to bring humans uh, and, and make them, give the agency for them to understand uh, how the algorithm is working, maybe there is no one size fits all. Maybe we cannot, or maybe there is, and we don't know what, what that generic algorithmic nudge would be. And there are a few more questions that when I was thinking about this more deeply that came up. Maybe the answer to it is we have to design more heuristic based uh, people-centric nudges, more like personalized nudges. But then the question is, should we really do that? Should we really design these personalized nudges? Because then that opens a whole other can kind of forms of problems, right? And then the third and final thing uh, that I'm debating is uh, this, this question about reflective thinking versus automatic thinking. So reflective thinking is costly. Like for every small decision, you cannot really wait and keep reflecting before making that decision, which is why people go to automatic, automatic thinking. So when we are designing this technology, uh, uh, the human AI uh, technology, where should we draw the line? When should we think about triggering the system, triggering the reflective system versus triggering the automatic system? And then, and then how should we do that more efficiently? And I think finally the question is, I mean, should we as algorithmic designers, uh, uh, w should be taking that control and, and doing it the, the way we want to you know, flip the switch from, al from reflective versus automatic uh, <coughs> triggering of the system? Okay, so switching gears uh, to the second part. So auditing to investigate uh, algorithmic systems for all sorts of different problems that they have. And I'm gonna talk about the search systems for misinformation. So uh, it was good that Jenna kind of set the stage about some of these uh, topics, uh, uh, about the problems with uh, algorithms. So th this is a book from the uh, 90s. This is Fix's book from the 90s, which kind of talks about that auditing has has been there for a while, right? And then nowadays people are talking a lot about uh, auditing algorithms. So this talks about measuring of discrimination in America. And the first code on the on the left side on there, uh, it says, just to give the context, why auditing is an important concept and then why it's difficult to do it uh, in the first place on systems. So here, here's the code, I'm gonna read through it. So when a black or Hispanic is treated w worse than a white, 
in uh, comparable circumstances, how can we be sure that the differential treatment is because of the race or because of some other factor, extraneous factor, which we are not measuring, right? So how do we measure uh, that uh, through our auditing techniques that th this is exactly the factor because of which discrimination is happening? So uh, coming back to the concept of misinformation and, and um, the, the, what we were trying to measure here is how can, we how can we audit search algorithms? So our only uh, focus here is the search systems, different types of search algorithms. And then what we are measuring is misinformation. So essentially, is, is, is whatever the search algorithm is returning, is that, uh, is that different based on if you are a user from a rural area versus uh, uh, an urban area. So the measure is your, your uh, extent of misinformation that is being returned is based on your geographic location. Uh, so we are still running these, so I don't have all the results, but this is just to motivate what the problem is. So this is how the Google's uh, search platform looked like uh, a couple of years ago. So if you looked for the term precedence in the clan, the first result is a list of five uh, people, and it actually points to that website, uh, a bogus website, and, and this, is, this is an incorrect result. But this, this was the first result that, that got returned. And these are, there are like many, many examples like this. So, uh, this is when I was looking for, this is from last night, uh, when I just typed in 9-11 conspiracy, not even the word conspiracy in full. Uh, the, the, the second result, the first result is of course debunking, uh, so it, it shows me uh, uh, debunked re uh, conspiracy theories. But then the second and third results are all pro-conspiracy video. Then the next example, again from last night, uh, vaccine, I didn't even type in the whole word causes, and then I see all these uh, various results, vaccine cause asthma, vaccine cause peanut allergy, so every, all sorts of vaccine scares, right? And, and this has been talked in, in, by lots of bloggers. But the question is we have not really measured how bad the problem is, right? And, and where the problem, uh, what are the measures where, where the problem occurs? Um, another aspect that has not been actually talked about a lot is taking this concept from uh, web search algorithms to social media search algorithms. So, so I, I, my background is social computing, so I'm, I'm very much fascinated about doing the same kind of study on social platforms. So if you, if you do the same search uh, for a different topic, chemtrails on Reddit search, so Reddit, Twitter, all of them have search uh, feature. So chemtrail, for those of you who don't know, it's a conspiracy theory. So whenever uh, flights fly in high altitude and they leave these condensation trails, right? And then there is this theory that uh, these uh, trails are essentially chemicals sprayed by the government to control the public. So and th this is a whole, uh, whole thread and communities who just talk about that. So essentially if you search for chemtrails, here what you see, it's not just pointing you to a set of search results, but it's also pointing you to a set of communities, subreddits, uh, where, where, and users who are, uh, where you can basically bond with them and talk about this, these uh, same, same topics, right? So the question is how bad the problem is, and then, and then the next question is, so far search algorithms, of course it's returning all relevant results, but there is no concept of credibility or uh, accuracy, right? And, and in, in terms of should, should the algorithm return this, these results, although being relevant, they are not really credible. So we did a bunch of uh, experiments, uh, quickly gonna go through this, essentially setting up three accounts. First is a control account, which search for the word chemtrail video, an experimental account uh, treatment, which searches for the word, uh, searches for the query chemtrail video, and then goes and watches uh, a misinformation, a pro-conspiracy video on that topic. And then the third account uh, uh, behaves similar to the experiment two account, where it watches, uh, searches, but then it watches a debunking video. So it's, 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 it's expected that for the account two, uh, you're gonna get more recommendation and more search results, which is pushing you towards the uh, pro-conspiracy video, and which is what we found when we analyzed those search results and recommendation, recommended results. But what was scary and fascinating at the same time was the third uh, result. So basically what we found is, even when the, that account watches for debunking video, and if it keeps doing that for a few 10 iterations, we found at some point the recommended videos start going towards pro-conspiracy. It's no longer debunking videos that are being recommended. So that, that was a scary thing. And so my students uh, yesterday actually presented his poster showing how easily through YouTube you could, you could get into this bubble of, of uh, 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 conspiracy theory. So I'm not gonna talk about that. But just to, in closing, the, the questions is, 
Uh, how do we even measure and understand these sort of black box algorithm where the algorithm is hosted by these powerful companies, right? So as an outsider, how do we do it? How do we audit the algorithm without taking, it, taking the system out, out of context, right? So that's the auditing in the loop. And then I think another very important question is how do we do it reliably? How do we do it ethically? And how do we do it legally? So you, the question of legality comes into picture because by the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, you, you are, if you're scraping data, you can actually be put behind bars. And there, there are a lot more rules. And uh, we can talk about that in the workshop discussion session. And then the uh, second thing that I uh, mention is, uh, I call it uh, running the right sniff test. So we, we talked a lot about discrimination, fairness, uh, misinformation in this uh, my talk. But are we, are we missing out something? Are we mis missing out other aspects that we, that we really need to study? And, and those are already uh, problematic in the current algorithms. We don't know. And then the final one, I think, is the hardest problem, which, uh, which probably we should talk about. How do we, as, as academics, uh, when we, how do we maintain and sustain these regular auditing platforms? Because this is expensive. So with the limited resources that we have, uh, how do we do it? Because it's, it's also necessary to do uh, regular frequent audits as you, as on these platforms. Uh, over and over again, right? So, right, with that, these are the current students and few collaborators. Mike is in the room, I didn't put his picture, uh, but he has, uh, he has been a very uh, uh, great collaborator for the first project. And with that, I'll end my talk. Happy to take questions. So hold that thought. <laughs> and um, I'm Deborah Tater. I'm uh, a professor here of computer science. I've, as I said earlier, I've been teaching classes for many years, or several years anyway, on designing to change power and authority. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about any of those things today. Instead, I want to engage you with some active uh, uh, thinking yourself, which may help in the, few, in, the work, in, in the other components of the workshop. And uh, we're going to use a tool that was developed in my lab called ThoughtSwap. Chandani Shrestha is the graduate student who's been working on this most recently. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is, in some ways, this is not about, um, it's not about algorithms that make you think, it's just about making you think. Right, and the way we make you think is uh, through changing up the uh, processes in the room. And um, so ThoughtSwap has an unfamiliar process for provoking discourse. And so I'm going to give you an overview of it a little bit, and then we're going to uh, use it. So the process has three parts. Hope you can read this in the back. Um, the facilitator, who in this case is me, is going to give you a prompt in ThoughtSwap. You're going to, uh, then you're going to spend a minute thinking. 
you only get one minute because I only have 20 minutes to do this whole thing. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask you to write for th individually for three to four minutes in thought swap and submit your thought. Then the second phase is you submit it, it comes to me. And I am going to distribute your thoughts the randomly, except that you will not get your own. That's the only thing we ensure. And I'm going to give you some instructions then for small group discussion. There's a lot of people in the room, actually more people than I expected. So um, I'm hoping you will form yourself up into groups of three and discuss uh, uh, the instructions that I give you for about five to seven minutes. Uh, we'll see how time goes. And I hope we'll have time to report back. But uh, this is what we're going to do. Any questions about this? If you are not on, most of you I assume are on VT Wireless. If, but if you could get, if you have devices with you, you should get them onto, uh, you should actually connect them. Here are some things you should know. Anything you write in ThoughtSwap is anonymous. That means we don't know your name uh, and n neither will the people who receive your thoughts. We're concerned here with ephemera and understanding giving the group access to the whole range of views. S swapping allows us to ask you to represent, of course it's very interesting to ask all of you what you're thinking, but maybe it's more interesting to ask you what somebody else is thinking. And that's what we do with the swapping. We're going to ask you first to represent yourself through this writing, but then to think about what somebody else believes, OK? And uh, then you'll, if we get to report back, that will inform you know, other people about even how you heard what they said, which may not be the way they anticipated. So what I want you to do is go to this website, please. And when it says code name, you all type in uh, algorithms that make you think. That is A-T-M-Y-T, -T, all lowercase, right? And uh, when you've done that, I am going to give you a, don't do anything right away. I'm going to give you a prompt. And then you're going to think, write three to four minutes, and submit. Is everybody clear about what they're going to be doing when you get the prompt? Okay. So, now, I, won't, I use this a lot in, um, pardon? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, where did it go? Yes, but where did it go? There it is. <laughs> sorry. So the, the, it is A-T-M-Y-T, -T. so it's algorithms that make you think, right? A-T-M-Y-T. Mm -hmm. Oh, nobody can read that, even I can't read it. <laughs> oh well. A-T-M-Y-T. When, is, is everybody there? Anybody having any problems? See, what I do usually is I teach, do this in a class, and then the students you know, know how to do this each time. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a new session and a new prompt. And this is the prompt. Now, what experiences should we give students so that they Learn to develop algorithms that make us think better, right? So all of us here are either students or professors, or most of us are involved in academia or at least teaching. And um, what I thought it would be interesting to do is we've, we've been thinking about, well, what's important to do? Right. What's important to, to do uh, with algorithms? What's important to do with the systems we design? And I'd like you to think about what we should do to, in teaching for a minute. Thought, what, what? You didn't receive it? You didn't receive it. Have you 
Why not? Pardon? Did I goof in the group? Yes. Can we try? Oh, I'm so sorry. We we are. We are. Can we paste it in? We'll do it again. We have a little timing problem, which uh, for some reason we. Okay, good, good, good. So think, right? There's a clock up there. You've got four minutes. Now remember, this is to start a conversation. It's not to end the conversation. Okay. You have um, like about one minute, so uh, I'll tell you when you absolutely just have to hit submit even though you're not maybe ready, okay?
okay, you must submit, hit submit, okay? It, it, otherwise, what you've written will be lost. So whatever it is, just, is everybody okay with that? Okay. So you can see that we have a, a, a wide number of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, responses. So that's pretty good. And um, I'm going to change my instruction a little bit based on what I saw from you uh, for the discussion in small groups. Um, so I'm going to, I haven't sw swapped your thoughts yet, but I'm going to do that. You're going to form a group with maybe three people in it to discuss. And uh, what I was thinking of asking you is how more precisely would you enact the vision in the thought that you've received, right? So what would you do to make that real? But as it happens, there's a wide variety of levels of recommendation. So some people in, in responding to this sort of gave little algorithms. They're like, you do this, then you do that, then you do the third thing, right? Other people uh, advanced more of what I would call a vision. So this is how I learn as an instructor, right? I didn't know what this group would do, and you did something that uh, was marvelously different than what I anticipated. So um, what I think you should do is if you received something that was very specific, what you want to discuss is why. What, what, is the, what, what is the motivation? What is the implicit theory behind that specific recommendation that this other person is, you know, is, it gave you. And if they gave you a vision, then go the other way and think about what, uh, what you would do to manifest that in what context, with what students. Always these are things to think about. Okay. And this is very interesting. Why are these things not where I expect them to be? Okay. So I have to go back up to the now I am distributing. Everybody should have a thought that is, as soon as it goes, everybody should have a thought that's not their own. And um, I, I, um, I would love us to get all the way through this, but it is now 11 o'clock and I have one minute. So you have basically one minute to start discussing. And, I, uh, and what I'm going to encourage you to uh, at least engage in a little bit of discussion. Oh, we have two options. We can take five minutes now, or after lunch we can start the breakout session with this, whatever you decide to do. Is lunch now, or is, no, lunch no, is no, in an hour. hour. We have, yeah. we have uh, things. Okay, well, at least look at what you got and think about it in your own head, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. That's very kind of you. And we can come back and fill that. Okay. So don't delete them if, you know. Oh. Okay. Uh, we have time for a, for, a, for a quick break while we prepare the lightning talks, but these are going to go fast. <laughs> Okay, you need help?